I had planned a Dharma talk and then I realized that today is April 8th, which in the Western calendar is Buddha's birthday. So we're in the midst of uh, what the uh, Catholics at least call Holy Week, um, but it's not just for Catholics and Christians. It's of course been, it's uh, Easter on uh, Sunday, but um, for uh, people of the Jewish faith, it's uh, the first night of Passover. Some of our group is uh, at virtual Passover seders tonight. Uh, for us Buddhists, it's uh, Buddha's birthday. And if I'm not mistaken, Ramadan starts, uh, maybe it's Sunday, maybe it's a little bit later. Um, and I'm sure there's some Hindu celebration happening right now. Um, so it's a very poignant time of year. It's in my neck of the woods, it's spring. There's this lovely Zen phrase that Zen Master Sung San used to quote all the time and it's uh, spring comes, the grass grows by itself. And if we all look around, we'll notice that fact. None of us had to do anything for the grass to grow. The grass isn't affected by the coronavirus. Life just keeps happening. Um, and the natural world just continues to function of course, quite affected by our human activity. Um, I saw in the paper today that in India, the view of the Himalayas is something that people haven't seen in their own lifetime because pollution has so decreased. The air and the, the sky in the Bay Area where I live is, is quite um, clear. Um, I saw also that Los Angeles may have the um, the cleanest air in the whole world, and that's quite a change for Los Angeles. So I'm sure we're all struggling and working with the change in our lives by being um, at home as much as we are, uh, but I think it's also important to remember that there are positive and there are negative aspects, just as all things in our human world there's both good and bad. And um, all of us give those labels of good and bad to a situation. The situation is just as it is. Spring comes, the grass grows by itself. So another phrase we use in our Zen practice is mind makes everything. We can certainly argue about the role of mind in the um, coronavirus that we're all dealing with, but ultimately our mind makes good and bad, right and wrong. Our mind determines what we like and what we don't like. And for most of us, we live in that world of our likes and dislikes. And though the likes and dislikes are natural human functioning, our problem is, is that we attach to it and we get lost in the dream world of our own story. And that really is the basis of our suffering. So since it is Buddha's birthday, I don't want to take the time and tell the whole story of the Buddha's birth. Um, most of you probably know about it. But I'm going to say just a few words about it, and I'm going to make a few comments about it. And then hopefully, if I have time after that, I'm going to read a poem by Zen Master Sung San, which speaks to just what I've been talking about, about mind making everything. So in the story of the Buddha, it starts off where the Buddha is born. Of course, it has to be mythological because it said that the Buddha was born out of, I think it was the left hip of his mother. So um, it wasn't quite immaculate conception, but I guess it was immaculate uh, birth. But anyway, about a week later, the Buddha's mother died. 
And that's often a piece of the story that gets spoken to and then very quickly moved on. But I think it's important for us to take a moment and just recognize the deep trauma and suffering that the Buddha experienced in his very, very early in infancy. This concept, life is suffering, is conceptual, but all of us have these deep, deep sufferings that occur, to occur, occur in our lives and we're left to have to manage our life and figure our way through it. So, and a very important part of the Buddha's birth story is the suffering and the loss of his mother and the human experience of having to move on and having to find a life in the face of the difficulties, the, um, the painful things that happen to us. So this young baby was not immune to that. Being born into a royal family did not save him from that suffering of the loss of his mother. The story goes that when the Buddha was born, there was a prophecy. And the prophecy stated that either this young boy was going to grow up to be a great political leader which is what his family hoped he would be, or he would grow up to be a great spiritual teacher. That prospect of him growing up to be a great spiritual teacher was the opposite of what his father wanted for him. So in some ways you can say his father hatched a plan. How can I make it so that this young boy will grow up to be a king rather than a spiritual leader. And now, of course, remember, I'm giving you my take on the story. I'm highlighting what I think is important today. And so the Buddha's father hatched this plot to lie to him, to fool him, to hide from him the realities of life in the human world. So he was sheltered in the palace. He didn't know about poverty. He didn't know about sickness. He didn't know about growing old. And he didn't know about death. All of his desires were satisfied. He was given everything he wanted, probably a fantastic education. All the things that his father hoped would lead him to be a great king. Of course, if you think about it, in order to pull off this plan, any time people started getting old, he had to kick them out of the palace. Any time anybody had any sickness, they had to be expelled. There was a constant effort to keep him sheltered from the realities of life. And I think what's important is that this, this situation that the Buddha dealt with was, of course, quite unique and different from anything all of us have experienced. But in some ways, we all share the same misinformation and maleducation. We're all taught from a very early age to be socialized to join in the culture that we live, to become like everyone else in one form or another, to follow the social norms. And in many ways, we're all lied to. We're not really told the reality of what this world could be. We're sheltered from a lot of things. So what happens by the time the Buddha has already been married, he's He's um, the father of a young son. Somehow he gets wind of what's called the four heavenly messengers. 
poverty, old age, sickness, and death. I think the way the story goes, he escapes from the palace. He starts to see some reality. First, he sees poor people. Then he sees sick people. Then he sees old people. And then he sees a corpse. And the game is over. The uh, fiction is now exploded. And the Buddha realizes that all of what he's been taught is limited and narrow and doesn't show him the full spectrum of human life. So for him, he left the palace. He took off into the woods, into the forest, which was what was happening in his day and age. And he raised this question, what am I? If this story is not correct, then what is this life? That's the origin of what we call in our Zen practice, great doubt. And I would guess that most everyone who's listening to this talk right now has some kind of experience like that, where you get an inkling that the reality that you believe to be so doesn't include the whole story. And each one of us set out on that journey to discover who we are, what am I, what is this life, what is real? Again, if you remember back to the beginning of my talk about how we get lost in our own story, our likes, our dislikes, our beliefs, our ideas, and we create this story and then we, we go through our lives picking and choosing things that help confirm our biases and have us believe our own fantasies, our own stories. And our Zen practice is about blowing up those stories, suddenly finding some clarity to be able to see that spring comes and the grass grows by itself. So the Buddha went off to the forest and he practiced for six years. He tried all the different practices that were um, present during that time period. None of them quite did it for him. And there's a story I particularly like that I read in uh, Karen Armstrong's biography of, of the Buddha, where very soon, just a few nights before he attained enlightenment, he remembered a story about his childhood. He was about five years old and there was a fall harvest celebration in the community and his nurses took him out into the uh, celebration. And he was sitting in an orchard and people were picking fruit and generally having a good time and almost Unique, unique to his life, he was left alone. And he was sitting there by himself. And the story goes is that he went inside himself and he had an opening and he could just experience the beauty of the moment, not um, mitigated by his thinking. He had his first enlightenment experience. And then he forgot about it life went on. And they say in his practice, he put so much effort into what he was doing. If you've ever seen a picture or a statue of the Buddha where his ribs are showing, it depicts the image that he st almost starved himself. The philosophy in those days was that if you could almost kill the human body, then the spiritual body would open up. And when he remembered that story of his childhood, that moment of just gently and without too much effort, he just opened. He realized that trying to push himself down and suffocate the body was a big mistake. And he drank some milk. And when he drank the milk, 
he lost all of his friends because they all felt like he had abandoned the practice. But that was the moment where he started to finally open. So we often talk in our Zen practice about great effort. But remember, great effort isn't this bullying through something. Buddha taught the middle way, not too tight, not too loose. Do your practice every day, but don't strain. Recognize that you already have it. You already are it. The Buddha didn't attain something new when he attained his enlightenment. He realized what he already was, and he recognized that he already had it. We don't practice to become something different. We practice to return to our own nature, which is always here. Which leads me to the poem. It's a beautiful transition right into it. Um, I'm going to read this from The Whole World is a Single Flower, which is our, our koan book, our kangan book. And uh, for those of you who have the book and want to look at it later, it's number 177. And it's called Original Face, poem by Zen Master Sung San. Your true self is always shining and free. Human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. Only without thinking can you return to your true self. The high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming, going. Let me read you that one more time. Original face poem by Zen Master Sung San. Your true self is always shining and free. Human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. Only without thinking can you return to your true self. The high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming, going. And now I'll read you Zen Master Sung San's commentary. Follow speech, lose your life. Follow meaning, go to hell. Open your eyes. What do you see now? What do you hear now? Original face and truth already appear in front of you. So I want to say a few words about the poem and then uh, I will open up for some questions. So your true self is always shining and free. That's the most important point. You already are it. Don't look for it outside of yourself. Turn your gaze inward. What am I? Already you're complete. Already you have it. Again, as I said, the Buddha's enlightenment was not about becoming something he was not. It was about returning to something that he already was. We all already have it. We all already are it. But as Zen Master Sung San goes on to say, human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. We go into that human world of the human mind the things that we create, the good, the bad, the right, the wrong, the opinions, the beliefs, the political affiliations, all of the things that we think are so important. And of course, on one hand, they are. I'm not meaning at all to minimize it. But on the other hand, there's something something that already exists. (laughs) Just so you know, my... My cat opened my door and we have a little guest who came visited us. So (laughs) she doesn't like being held. Anyway, you never know what's going to happen next. Our practice is to stay open. Your true self is always shining and free. It's always here. We get lost in the dream of our mental creations. 
think about your life. What's real and what's fiction? What stories do you make up? And how much do those stories control and impact how you see and how you work, how you move through the world? So Zen Master Sung San says, human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. When he says making something, he was talking about um, wanting, holding, attaching, and checking. Wanting, we all understand. That shiny object, that praise from another person, that thing that we think if we get, it will fulfill us and then we'll be good enough. That's wanting. Holding is how we grab on to things. We won't let go. Once we have it, we're afraid to lose it. The Buddha said, we suffer for two reasons. We suffer because we don't have what we think we want. And we suffer because we're afraid to lose what we have that we want. Think about it. All of us know what that's like. I've got something, I don't want somebody to take it away. So we close down, we hoard. People are going to the grocery stores and can't find toilet paper because we get afraid and we grab things and then we don't want to share it because we're afraid. Attaching usually refers to attaching to ideas and beliefs. Look at any country, there's people from all over the world on this, on this call today. Every country has this fighting, fighting, my way is the best way. No, no, you're, you're wrong, I'm right, and we're always fighting. It's often not even about what we're fighting about. It's just that attachment to our ideas. So in our practice, we're working towards letting go loosening the, bond, the, the, the bondage of wanting, holding, and attaching. And then I want to get to the fourth one, which is checking. Checking is one that is a little harder for people to get, especially the language doesn't quite say it. But checking really means self-doubt. Am I okay? Will people like me? Should I be better? How can I get what I want? I'm not good enough. All of that perseveration, that fear, all of the way that leads us to act in ways that is actually counterproductive. But we're so afraid. We're so feeling diminished that we get lost in that feeling and we lose our way. So remember, the line says, human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. As we hold, as we attach, as we desire, and as, excuse me, as we check, we get lost. Our true self may always be shining and free, but we get so lost into that mental dream, that fear of inadequacy, that fear of scarcity, that fear of not being enough, that we create a whole world around that. And even though our true self is always here, it's never separate from us, we can't find it. Which is why it's so important when we're doing our practice, return to our lower abdomen, slowly breathing in, slowly breathing out, finding the stability of our center, getting out of the, the prison of our mind and the prison of our emotion, moving down into the freedom of our center and our lower abdomen. Zen Master Sung San used to poke us in our, just below our navel with his stick and he'd say, make your center stronger, stronger, stronger. But that doesn't mean tight. It doesn't mean rigid. It means open and flexible, resilient, able to move with the situation without getting lost in our mental formations. 
And the poem ends with, only without thinking can you return to your true self. That's what I'm talking about here, letting go of the dream, letting go of the story, not getting so lost in our thought feeling paradigm, opening to the grass that is simply growing by itself. And that phrase is a little bit different at the end of this poem. The high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming, going. The truth just as it is. And there's, there's a hidden piece in that last line. The mountain and the cloud are in relationship to each other. If you look at high mountains, you almost always at some point during the day see a cloud around it. The mountain and the cloud are in relationship. Just as all of us are in relationship with all the different things of our life, be they people, animals, plants, rocks, everything. The name of this book I just read out of is The Whole World is a Single Flower. Each one of us, each thing in this whole universe is integral to the whole. Without each thing being in its place, the whole is changed. And each one of us is a piece of that universe, completely full and completely the universe expressing itself. It's an old Grateful Dead song that I like quite a lot. And there's one line in it that says, you are the eyes of the universe. Your eyes are how the universe sees, our nose, is how the universe smells. Our tongue is how the universe tastes. We are the universe. And with our natural authentic life, the universe is expressing itself. And our job as practitioners is to find our way to let go of the dream, inhabit our true nature and use that true nature to help this world. Everyone is in relationship. Every moment of our life, we have a chance to give. We have a chance to connect and interact. What mind do we bring to that moment? What mind and heart do we bring to this particular situation? And if we practice, we start to open we can use this not knowing mind. We can use our original nature to help the world, to be alive, to connect, to love, to, to fight even. All the things that humans do, but to be open and honest and as much in our not knowing, don't know center as we can muster. That's called the, the great Buddha way, the great Bodhisattva way. How do I help this world become more whole, more connected, more alive? <laughs>